In his novel, 13 Moons, Charles Frazier tells the story of a boy named Will who is orphaned and he is sold into indentured servitude in the mountains of Western North Carolina, the Blue Ridge Mountains there. The book is set historically at the same time that the United States government is working to expel the Cherokee nation from that same region. The young boy Will is adopted by Bear, one of the tribal leaders of the remnant who have stayed loyal to their land and to their people. He makes Will his own son. And so in trying to integrate Will into um, the new nation that he is a part of, Bear comes down off the mountain one day to the store that Will manages. He sat on the porch and immediately started talking about how bad it is not to have a place in the world. Without a place where you belong, you have too many choices before you and therefore cannot go in any one direction. It is a fine line between too few choices and too many. As he saw it, I had too much freedom. Now Will protests this. He says, look, I am bound to this land by papers as an indentured servant. I have a place. I belong to it quite literally. So Bear clarifies and he says... Having a place means being bound in many different directions to the land, the animals, and the people, by relations and even to the names of places. Such ties are both comforting and discomforting. In some ways, it is easier to be an exile than to have responsibilities, but it is also sadder. I had no bonds and was therefore lost in the world. Connection to a place. It's primal. Many different religious expressions talk about the importance of a sacred place. We know it in our own life stories as well. The Bible in the book of Genesis shows the deep connection between human beings and place and earth, for it describes the formation of humankind that God forms them from the dirt and breathes into them the breath of life. We are made of dirt, and so we are connected to the land, to place, to animals, to vegetation, to it all. We are, as Bear says, bound in many directions. And so for those of you who are new this Sunday, which is a lot of you, um, we're in a sermon series right now, a storytelling sermon series. It's birthed out of a class that I led in the fall. Uh, that class was intended to help us see some theological themes that could help us to grow in our Christian faith and to mature in our Christian living. One of those themes that we looked at was the rooting place, a deep connection to a particular geographic spot. But of course, we can't be connected to a geographic place without the people that we are connected to in that place, to the specific geological features of that location to the customs and traditions that make it what it is. Knowing a deep rooting in God through this place focuses our attention on what is immediately before us so that we begin, we begin to see with new eyes more deeply into the world. We come to admire and appreciate the eccentricities to those that we live with and we value the continuation and the honoring of the traditions that have made this place holy. In our passage from Hebrews today, we hear about some specifics of a rooting place, but also some transitions that are happening in this newly forming Christian community. The passage begins by pointing out that you should listen to those who have spoken the word of God to you. Who are those who have showed you the life of God. We are to imitate them, we hear. Who are those people who have shared that sacred ground, that rooting place among us? But then there's this section about dietary practices, about certain dietary practices of the Jewish faith of many of these new Christians. And the author of Hebrews is saying that those aren't as necessary for Christians as they have been in the past. He talks about the priests and the preservation of the sacrificial system in the temple and is saying that that is no longer a practice that needs to be maintained. Instead, the Christians are to go outside the camp to see that place 
as holy. We're not bound to a rooting place in a particular location, but built for a city that is to come. And so for the Christian, there's not a particular holy land that needs to be preserved or maintained. Outside the camp is holy. 24015 is holy. 24018 is holy. 24153 is holy. They already know that. (laughs) 24014 is holy. (laughs) Wherever you live, your street, your house, it is a place alive with the grace of God. And a mature faith comes to dwell in the ordinary rooting place when it is not simply a home of memory and nostalgia, but that rooting place begins to become a misty revelation of eternity with God, a heavenly place. So what does this kind of ordinary, extraordinary rooting place look like? Who are the leaders who spoke the word of God to you in that place? Where have you been rooted outside the camp to be pointed to a city that is yet to be revealed? Or perhaps you haven't had that rooting place. You've been a wanderer. But now you find is the time to sink in some roots, to dig deeply, to find the presence of God in those ordinary spaces. Well, while you're pondering those questions in your own life, where that calling from our Lord is coming from, I want to invite one of our storytellers from our class this fall to come and share a rooting place in his own life. So at this time, I'd like to invite Wade Whitehead forward to share with you his story. Miss Audrea Kazee ran the Central Presbyterian Church nursery on Wednesday nights, where I would go while my parents Bible studied after the weekly fellowship dinner. As there wasn't any children's option, that's where anyone under about 10 headed after eating dessert from the far end of the potluck. I would play with toys from the shelf color with those jumbo crayons in already colored coloring books. And I'd listen as Miss Kazee told us Bible stories from her rocking chair. And later, when I was old enough, I helped in that nursery each week, engaging toddlers, surviving diaper changes, and accepting on the way out compensation of one rain-blow gumball from the wrapped stack that Miss Kazee kept in her purse. Her assistant, Thelma Pennington, was always there, too, but never seemed to be in charge. She poured juice from the cold high sea can, made and cleaned bottles for the babies, and always gave each of us a hug. Now, while Miss Kazee was proper, with a soft voice and done hair, Miss Pennington, or Pen Pen as we called her, was not. Pen Pen had long silver hair, pulled into a bun. She wore dresses that she made herself. Her hands were calloused from garden tools and canning lids. And I'm sure that more than once I smelled chewing tobacco on her. Miss Kazee looked and acted and sounded like the other older women at church, but Pen Pen always reminded me more of the men. Occasionally, my parents asked Miss Kazee to babysit my brother and me. My folks were always deacons or elder, elders or on some various church committee, and they somehow completed master's degrees while working full-time as elementary classroom teachers. So whenever they had a meeting or a class to attend, we would load up the silver station wagon and we'd ride to Miss Kazee's house behind the WFHG AM 980 radio station on Valley Drive. Now her living room was set up just like the nursery. The same books, the same toys, a rocking chair, 
the same smell. And being there was very much like being at church. In fact, when it was time to go home, she would give us each one rainbow gumball from the stack in her purse. Well, one day, I guess, Miss Kazee wasn't available or didn't answer the wall phone, or maybe she just needed a break from kids. So my parents called Pen Pen, who offered to keep my brother and me at her house. That drive was out toward the lake, off to the right, along a creek that pushed close enough to the road to flood it several times a year, and the final bit was unpaved and wound deep into the Appalachian woods, eventually running out at the end of a holler, right in front of a small white house with a metal roof and beside two large barns. It was impossible to tell if we were still in Virginia or if we'd wandered into Tennessee. Past chickens in the yard and a dog or two on and under the porch, Pen Pen shouted through the open windows, bring them on in. Now inside Pen Pen's front door was the kitchen and her cast iron wood stove. It'll burn you if you touch it, she warned us. My parents left and she told my brother and me, Dinner's in an hour. Play by the pond in the creek in the barn. Carl Allen don't want you in his tools, but I've got some you can use if you need. Just stay out of the house for a little bit and I'll get your supper made. And with that, we went outside. Under smooth stones in the creek, we found jet black crawdads. On the pond, we skipped rocks past the water striders. High on the hillside, we chipped away at flaky exposed rocks with her rusty trowels. We sat on a dead tractor. We found the bones of some small mammal in the back of the shed. For dinner, we had a feast of roasted potatoes, homemade pickles, green beans, and a hillbilly pizza topped with venison that Pen Pen said she had collected herself. One side of her family was Iroquoian, so I imagine she'd taken a buck that morning with a homemade arrowhead and a single draw on her bow. And we ate every bite, and then she uncovered a warm cobbler full of blackberries picked along the trail that led to her husband's bandstand where he played banjo with his friends on Saturday nights. And after cleaning up from dinner and a few minutes in the bathtub, I remember sitting in her living room in my pajamas, my hair not quite dry, as she sang bluegrass songs. On subsequent visits, she walked us into the woods, showing us where bears had scratched on the trunks of oak trees. She showed us butterfly trails and a beaver dam. Once, she saw an abandoned hornet nest high in the trees, and she knocked it loose with a rock, and it fell to the ground, and she gave it to us. And back at the house, we looked at it for an hour before pulling it apart with pliers. And after dark, she set it on fire in the yard. <laughs> One time, she asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. I was nine, I had already decided I was going to be a globe-trotting archaeologist. And at her house the next week, she pointed me to a section of her yard that she said don't look quite right. And she asked me to dig into it, and I found more than 30 pennies underground. And we cleaned them and put them in a shoebox, and I took them home. Years later, she admitted to burying them after going to the bank to request the oldest coins in the drawer because she knew I would look at the dates. Even after passing the needing a babysitter age, I would still ask my parents to take us to Pen Pens when they needed to be somewhere. A few times we stayed overnight, which gave us time to hike up the mountainside to see her grandsons, Buddy and Kai Hickey. And other times we were there for just a few hours. I always felt like I belonged to Pen Pen and that she belonged to me. 
She had grandchildren of her own just up a nearby trail, but she was faithful and righteous to my brother and me. I was hers, part of her family, one of her people. Many years later, I was in my college dorm room, 400 miles away, when Dad called to tell me Pen Pen had passed. And I could tell he'd been crying. He must have belonged to her, too. By the time I drove my own children out to the end of that holler many years later, her home was gone. The pond dried up. We parked the car and got out. I pointed to the hillside where I chipped that, those rocks, the woods where we found that nest, the soil where I dug that fortune. For me, it was and always will be a place where a covenant of belonging took root, where another person planted a harvest by making me hers, and from which I will always draw a sense of comfort and adventure and gratitude and fulfillment. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. Let us go to Jesus outside the camp, looking for the city that is to come, the city that is found in pennies, hidden in the yard, in rainbow gumballs, in formal Bible lessons, and in hiking muddy trails in the mountains. May we too dig deeply into the rooting places of our lives so that we can see eternally to our true home beyond the holler. Amen. <laughs>